So my name is Maggot Sembel, and uh, I'm the Associate Director of the School of Community and Regional Planning. And it is uh, my deep pleasure to welcome you this evening as we gather to uh, celebrate and, and honor uh, John Friedman, who is a, uh, a living legend in our, in our world of, uh, of urban planning. And let me start by introducing uh, Dr. Mark Prolonge, the, who's the Dean of the Faculty of, of Applied Science and also a, a professor in, in Civil Engineering. And uh, um, Mark is, uh, Mark's research is in the broad area of environmental and fluid mechanics, primarily uh, relating to the measurement and simulation of air and water flows over complex terrain. And just one more thing, Mark, before he has, he has received numerous awards for his academic achievements, including the McElwain Medal of the American Geophysical Union in 1997 and the Dolphin Medal of the European Geosciences Union in 2007. <coughs> so please join me in welcoming Mark. So this is really the highlight in, in so many ways for the beginning of this year. It's, it's really an honor. John, be invited, and, and Penny and Maggot, thank you for uh, for this special occasion. I understand we're celebrating a birthday. Is that true? It's already okay. Well, it's a we year long birthday. <laughs> we can still celebrate. So I think it's just uh, you know it's so important for us. Uh, I, I don't know, John, if you know, you know they have all these university rankings, and I, I have my own university ranking. And by the way, UBC does very well on my particular ranking. Uh, but uh, it's really, uh, you know, it's thanks to people like you, John, that bring such distinction and honor uh, to the university. I was in a you know, school of uh, architecture, civil and environmental engineering, and urban planning in, in Switzerland, and people, when I was uh, talking to them about coming to UBC, you know, so important to them that you were here, and so really that's, I think, a very important draw and, and, and really makes uh, you know, the Faculty of Applied Science uh, really a special place. And so all that you have done for the university, it's, it's just a delight for me to be here, and I couldn't uh, you know, imagine a better thing to do here at the end of this uh, beginning of the, uh, the winter season with the, with the, the weather. You know, so it's really a delight, and I look forward with great pleasure to your talks. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next up, we have Dr. Tim Cheek, who is a professor in the Institute for Asian Research. Uh, Asian Policy Program and co-director of the Center for Chinese Research. Tim's research, teaching, and translating focus on the recent history of China, especially the role of Chinese intellectuals in 20th century and the history of the Chinese Communist Party. Tim also tells me that he's a self-appointed junior fellow in radical social practice. <laughs> 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 Please join me in welcome. We have to see if John was, you know, daydreaming or not. There you go. I'm delighted to be here and to speak on behalf of the Center for Chinese Research and the Institute of Asian Research because uh, John uh, has been a longtime member of our community, and uh, he's been an unusual member, not coming as an Asian linguist. And uh, it has been a growth process for all concerned. And uh, in fact, as I look back on it now, the, uh, I, my time with John since my first year here in 2002, and with my belief, uh, working with students and working on uh, projects to do with China, since you know he did a book in 2005 on uh, Chinese urban planning. And uh, the, uh, the long and the short of it is, is that I... Looking back today, uh, see the secret background, if you like, or the actually the operating system that was going on, though he never used the words, in my presence, of social practice or radical social practice or the good society, which is the theory that he put forward in the book, The Good Society, in 1979. But it is, as he wrote, all dialogue is open-ended and allows for transformation of self and other. And essentially, 
my 15 years of relationship with John has been that dialogue and his participation at the Center for Chinese Research and the institution, Institute of Asian Research has been exactly that. This social practice, even radical social practice, is a dialogue, as you know, if those of you are familiar with his work, in small groups, face to face, with task specific, in task specific settings. It's about doing things together. And for me, what I've drawn from this is that the effort is a process, a process of trying, listening, and responding. That's what counts. That community and dialogue are verbs. It is what we do. And it's the commitments we make here and now. In this meeting, in this curriculum review committee, in this revisioning of the institute, in this class, with this student, face to face. And as his quote that I started with suggests, dialogue has to be open to changes. It changes us. It changes each other. And so it has changed me and it has changed John. He is a veritable book of changes, our own Chinese classic. So Dr. Penny Gerstein, who will introduce John, is Professor and Director of the School of Community and Regional Planning and the Center for Human Settlements here at UBC. She specializes in the soci sociocultural aspects of community planning, with particular emphasis on those who are the most marginalized in planning processes. She is co-chair of the Pacific Housing Research Network and a registered member of the Canadian Institute of Planners. She is the 2016 recipient of the YWCA Women of Distinction Award for Education, Training, and Development. Please join me in welcoming. So I've had the pleasure over, sort of now since uh, 2001, 2001 yeah, of, of having John as a colleague in our, in our department and our school. And it has been absolutely uh, an amazing experience for us. He, is, he has made us honest. He has made us sharper. He has made us critical, more, much more critical thinkers um, about everything. I mean, he, he, has, he has really just enlivened our school. He has, um, he's brought so much richness to it. It's, it's amazing. And I'm, I'm really sort of so thrilled that you have been an honorary professor in our school for, for this amount of time. I mean, I think it's, it's really sort of expanded the possibilities of what SCARP is. And it's really helped us define who we are. Um, you know, I think that your writings, in a theoretical level, you have also brought into your practice. And as, as Tim said, you really are a change agent. And I think that, you know, definitely we can see that um, in, in the school of how you've affected it. So thank you so much. So I have the real honor to introduce you. Um, John, um, you know, besides, you know, John uh, was the uh, founding director uh, in UCLA uh, of the, um, the Luskin School of Public Affairs. Uh, he's won sort of numerous honors. He um, you know, has three honorary uh, doctorates um, from internationally. Um, he's also just published, um, you know, extensively and wildly. Um, but one of the things that I also am really proud of that, you know, he when he came to UBC, he had really he he's, he kind of embarked on a whole new venture around um, exploring China, which is so critical and so appropriate for the fact that you know UBC and the linkages we have, and so the kind of work you've done, I think, has really sort of helped to to help us understand that kind of very complex planning process that's occurring in China. And so I want to, I'm just so thrilled that, you know, you agreed to give the same talk. It was actually a talk that he gave uh, at UCLA, and I just thought it was so appropriate for him to give the same talk here um, in honor for this um, sort of special birthday, which we won't name. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, I, the, he's, John is going to be talking about the ruse of reason, poverty, inequality, and personal freedoms in the People's Republic of China. 
Thank you, John. Well, this has been uh, a birth year rather than a birthday. Um, but uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, Mark, uh, you, you don't know, but my, my father's first degree was in civil engineering. And in the First World War, he built roads and bridges in, on the Italian front for the car and car uh, army in the, in the First World War. And then he went on to other things, but, but that was his first degree. And, and Tim, um, if we, I, first of all, I should say that Tim read this paper in draft form uh, earlier in the year and gave me some, we had a good discussion about it and so on. Uh, I, um, I'm not really a, a, a Chinese researcher, so to speak. I don't speak the language. Um, but um, but you got the as you, uh, you learned my dialogic um, writings on, and so you know about that and you talked about it and I learned from you you gave me confidence that I could become a China a scholar of some sort uh, even though my uh, critical audience are the lay people who who who, like most of us, only read about China. Uh, but if you dig deeper, you can discover many interesting things. So thank you for all your support over the years. And thank you also for your comments, Penny. So my objective this evening is to talk about poverty, inequality and personal freedoms in the People's Republic of China over two successive political cycles. The collectivist experiment under Mao from 1949 to 1979, followed by the reform period, a socialist market economy with Chinese characteristics initiated by Deng Xiaoping. A third still incipient cycle from 2012 onwards, in which I tentatively refer to as China's reach for global power, and which is currently led by uh, Xi Jinping, will be briefly introduced, followed by a coda, in which I discuss what I will call the rules of reason as it applies to my major theme. Over the past 65 years, China has undergone a very impressive and indeed transformative changes. Population has grown by 800 million, all of whom have been socially and economically incorporated as citizens, currently numbering 1.4 million billion. Economically, the country has achieved a level of moderate prosperity Home ownership has been achieved by more than 75% of urban residents, excluding migrant workers. Average lifespan at birth has been lengthened to 75 years. Illiteracy has been all but abolished with compulsory education extended to nine years. 250 million Children are now enrolled in elementary, middle, um, and high schools, with 12 million, um, while 12 million are studying in tertiary institutions. As a result of these and many other achievements, the PRC now stands on the threshold of becoming a global power. Before launching into the substance of my talk, where I address the question of personal freedom. Um, you might ask me why I chose this phrase rather than address the, 
the more fundamental question of political democracy, which many Western observers had hoped would somehow come about once a large middle class had emerged in China. But as Daniel Bell, a recent visitor to our campus, has pointed out, the liberal democratic model that we take for granted in Canada has no traction in present day China. Along with the many institutions that enable them, political freedoms are explicitly rejected as unsuitable for China, not only by the party state, but by many public intellectuals as well. On the other hand, what virtually all Chinese have happily embraced over the past two decades is something that we all take for granted. I refer to the wide range of personal freedoms, such as the freedom of choice, mobility, expression, except political expression, assembly that are claimed but whose actual enjoyment varies greatly with income, education, and health age, gender, and other characteristics of the population, as well as with the presence or absence of institutional guarantees. As we shall see during the years of communist rule, personal freedoms have been both suppressed and opened up. I turn now to the first political cycle the collectivist experiment under Mao Zedong. Upon taking power at the end of 1949, a high priority of the new regime was how to transform agriculture, from which 85% of the population made their living, and turn it into some version of socialist agriculture, meaning more production, more productive, egalitarian, and in Mao's personal vision, collectivist. On taking power, a series of experiments ensued in rapid succession. Land reform, peasant cooperatives, communes. What eventually emerged was a kind of military command structure, which had production teams at the base, brigade level strategic supervision, and at the top of the pyramid, comprehensive control by commune level cadre. In relation to its demographic size, China was short of arable land, and after land reform, individual land holdings were often too small and fields too fragmented and scattered to allow for greatly increased productivity. Pooling land resources, it was believed, would raise, for great, um, would, would raise individual land holdings often uh, to allow for greatly increased productivity. Pooling land resources, it was believed, would raise efficiencies of scale in production and bring China's rural population under the control of the party state. The task assigned to the agricultural sector, however, went considerably beyond the peasantry's subsistence needs. Rather, farming was to produce a substantial surplus that, while ensuring food security, would also finance the push to rapid industrialization. The key means for this challenging project were the so-called production teams that brought together anywhere from 25 to 50 neighboring households who would select a leader from among themselves. These teams would deploy land acquired in the preceding cooperatives and cultivate it as a single economically sized unit. About a fifth of the total acreage would be turned over to individual households for so-called sideline production, small livestock, fruit trees, vegetables, that could be sold for cash in nearby towns, while collective work 
was primarily to cultivate cereals. Two sayings were popular at that time. The first was, for the bottom of the rice bowl, rely on the collective. For the top of the bowl, rely on ourselves. That's the vegetables and the meat and so on that goes on top of the rice. And the, the second uh, saying was, for eating rice, rely on the collective. For money, rely on your private production. Moreover, during the winter, when field work was less demanding, production teams would work on local infrastructure projects for the village, that is improving irrigation canals, building roads, constructing an elementary school, and similar undertakings. The party state was largely absent from production teams. It was very much present, however, at the brigade level, to an even greater extent at the all-encompassing peasant commune. Basic services would be made available to everyone, including primary and secondary education, rudimentary health care, welfare services for orphans, widows and the frail elderly, and assistance with funeral expenses. As a whole, the commune was to be a self-sustaining enterprise. It would sell grains to the state at a fixed price and remunerate the individual members of production teams according to earned work points. Paid out partly in kind and partly in small amounts of cash. It would also engage in elementary industrial production, build village, factories, and support repair shops for, mach for machinery. Above all, the commune was responsible for the ideologically correct attitudes of villagers and was expected to mobilize the local population in the frequent ideological campaigns and struggle meetings that were periodically launched by the center. The urban counterpart to the commune to the commune system was the work unit or Dunway. Work units would be organized in large factories, government ministries, universities, hospitals, and other institutions to provide a combination of working and living space for their employees. The national welfare system established early on depended heavily on each Dunway to organize both the provision and management of a fairly comprehensive social security net for its workers. The implementation of this system required each done way not only to provide the necessary funds for all welfare programs for its members, but also demanded that they construct the physical infrastructure to house them. Each work unit would thus constitute a relatively self-sufficient community. As David Bray writes in his classic study, and I quote, the Chinese city was to develop more as a collection of self-contained and spatially defined communities than as an integrated urban network, end of quote. And he continues, the predominant urban spatial form was the downway compound, invariably an enclosed space marked out by a high surrounding wall. The compound was wall operates as a marker of social space. In traditional China, the wall defined the realm of the Confucian family and the space within which the family patriarch ruled supreme. In socialist China, the wall marks the realm of the production unit and the space within which the Dunway reigns. To complete the picture, during the collectivist period, China's borders were all but sealed. 
national development would be endogenous, her borders a virtual wall. In 1960, <clears throat> all Soviet advisors were withdrawn. Henceforward, China would follow her own genius. Second, rural areas were sealed off from cities. Each commune member would receive a local resident permit called Huko that was different from an urban Huko, thus allowing the movement between countryside and city to be strictly controlled. Factory workers were recruited from the countryside but would keep the rural permit in order to prevent mass migration to cities. Finally, Mao believed he could transform China into a socialist society through continuous social mobilizations, campaigns, and class struggles. Positive change, he thought, would ensure from living perpetually at the edge of chaos. But the Great Leap Forward campaign that he launched between 1958 and 61 turned into unmitigated disaster, resulting in perhaps the last of China's many historical famines in which tens of millions starved to death. The succeeding and notorious Great Cultural Revolution, which followed a few years later, and lasted until Mao's death in 1976, has come to be known as the Lost Decade. Even so, it must be admitted that overall economic growth, while fluctuating wildly from year to year, and in some years actually showing sharp declines, made some, if limited, progress. By the time Mao died, China was known to be one of the world's most egalitarian societies. To be sure, it was a frugal society, but members of communes and work units were guaranteed a basic livelihood. This was not poverty as we generally understand it, which depends on a comparison between those who have and those who have not. It was rather a leveling of life ways. Urban residents were marginally better off than their rural counterpart, counterparts because urban services such as housing were subsidized. And within the commune system, there were significant variations based on pro land productivity, transportation infrastructure, and location. <coughs> On the other hand, personal freedoms were suppressed. The Huko system prevented spatial mobility. Information about the world was channeled exclusively through the state. Individual initiative was seen as a form of rightist deviation and disallowed. All initiative remained with the party. And looking back on this now, China in the 1970s resembled nothing so much as a gigantic military compound. It reminded me of my years in the American Army. I was three years in the Army, and I had a whole year of, of training, first as a, as, a, as a private, and then later on, uh, you know, they needed second lieutenants because so many of them died on the front. Uh, so <clears throat> I was in basic training, and and I experienced this kind of regimented, minimal, frugal, uh, collective, and, and mandated order uh, in, on, on uh, my own person. So it's just, uh, that's where the, 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 the comparison comes from. <clears throat> Millions mourned when Mao died. But far-sighted leaders such as Deng Xiaoping realized that China, in its quest for modernity, 
was falling behind other East Asian nations, such as of course, Japan, South Korea, and was nowhere near to catching up with Western Europe. Indeed, the first high-level study missions that were sent to Europe were amazed by what they saw. They had to admit that by comparison, China was economically and technologically backward. Actually, the situation had become desperate. While rural pop and we're not talking about the late 70s, while rural population was growing at 2% a year, arable land had remained unchanged. Food had to be rationed, and people were living on the edge of starvation. On the other hand, the urban economy, heavy industry and business services could absorb little more than a third of the annual increase in the labor force. Mao's vision had failed. His utopian imagination had overreached itself. Deng concluded that Chinese socialism would have to reinvent itself. And that's the end of the first cycle. Now comes political cycle number two, the social, socialist market economy with Chinese characteristics. As a 16-year-old lad, Deng Xiaoping was among a handful of scholar workers who were sent to France in the early 1920s to study and observe the technologies and organizations of an advanced European society at first hand. While still in France, he joined the Chinese Communist Youth League in 1923, and on his return to China, took part in the so-called Long March led by Mao Zedong in the 1930s, became Mao's close comrade in arms at Yan'an, fought in the patriotic war against the Japanese from the beginning of the Popular Front, fought for another four years in the civil war that followed, and came to be trusted, a trusted leader during the collectivist period. But with Mao increasingly paranoid toward the end of his life, suspecting even his closest associates of disloyalty, Deng and his wife were banished to Jiangxi province to be re-educated through manual labor. His comeback in 1973, engineered by Mao himself, and rise to paramount leader in 1978, is a fascinating story, but too long to be told here. It was Deng Xiaoping who initiated yet another turn in the turbulent and often violent post-imperial history of his country, a turn he described as a socialist market economy with Chinese characteristics. There were no models for how to transit from collectivism to such an economy, and he counseled his fellow citizens to cross the river by feeling the stones. In fact, no one knew what would happen once China's borders were opened up, the collectivist economy dismantled, and Mao's practice of permanent class struggle replaced by bureaucratic rule. But Deng had the revolutionary prestige personal courage and strength of character to move forward into the unknown future and to learn from experience. Beginning in the 1980s, the new political cycle ushered in a monetized economy based on competitive market prices that created a new perception of poverty since poverty could now be measured by a household's disposable income. In the collectivist system, where everyone's livelihood was guaranteed, the, the rice bowl, 
that I mentioned earlier, the question of poverty was not a matter of policy concern. But in the new cycle, the poor could be directly compared to others who were not poor. As the commodification of life progressed, there were to be winners and losers. To be officially declared as indigent and relegated as a ward of the state proved to be a lengthy and difficult process. As described by Dorothy Solinger, a person had to publicly declare the destitution before becoming eligible for even the most minimal support of the state. The number of urban poor has been estimated at more than 50 million, or 8.5% of urban residents, not counting rural migrants. Even so, only a fraction of them would eventually be granted the minimum social subsidy, or DBAO. Above the stratum of the indigent are the working poor, a category that includes a fluctuating number of rural migrants from 120 to 170 million people in any one year, a huge proportion of the rural labor force who seek low paid work in factories, construction, and a variety of service jobs in cities and surrounding peri-urban areas. I will return to this story shortly. The next stratum are the vaunted property middle classes, which began to emerge in the context of the explosive economic growth of the 90s. It is an ambiguous social formation, which Li Zhang, a sociologist, characterizes as emergent, heterogeneous, fragmented, and precarious forever fearful of falling back into the category of the working poor from which they had escaped. Zhang, who did her field work in Kunming, capital of the southern province of Yunnan, estimates their overall numbers in Chinese cities at less than 16% of total population or roughly 30% of resident urban population or 200 million. When I say resident urban, it means people with an urban hukou, with an urban uh, permit to entitle them uh, to various uh, 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 facilities and, and, and provisions. Then the, on top of that, there's a large migrant population uh, that is not counted. At the apex of the social pyramid, this is the fourth level, above them is the 1% of the super rich and powerful, like everywhere, that we are familiar with that here. A few comments about rural migrants, which I will draw from Li Zhang's Kunming study, because it is the most graphic and concise account of their condition of life during the first post-millennium years. A few direct quotes will have to stand in for a more detailed discussion for which time is lacking. Zhang writes, and this is sort of dot points that I'm just quoting sentences from her, from her work. Although the buildings they create are highly visible in the urban landscape, they remain an invisible social group under substandard conditions. Another point. Overcrowding housing is a common problem facing construction workers. It was not uncommon to see 50 people crammed into a room 30 square meters without any privacy. Their beds were made of bamboo sticks and a piece of hard cardboard. Third. The daily meals for construction workers were very simple, consisting of rice or steamed buns and boiled or pickled vegetables. Meat was considered a rare luxury. 
Not getting enough to eat was a com constant complaint among migrant workers. Fourth, long delays in or denial of wage payments by the contractors or developers is a common problem faced by migrant construction workers. The average monthly wage in Kunming in 2006 was between 400 and 800 yuan. But getting this much or any money at all is not guaranteed. And lastly, the emerging real estate industry, as I observed in Kunming, displays a pattern of two opposite movements involving capital and labor. On the one hand, capital keeps moving up and becomes concentrated in the sectors controlled by developers, architects, and community planners. On the other hand, labor moves downward to small, flexible teams that tap into a rural migrant workforce to reduce costs and shed welfare, welfare responsibilities. I might add, no, it's my voice again. I might add that migrants, both registered and illegal, represent a huge portion of the urban population that is best described as socially excluded, shunned by the very people whom they benefit with their labor. They are generally perceived as dirty and uncouth, harboring latent criminal tendencies, and should preferably be hidden from public view. Even so, their labor is essential, and they are very much part of the urban scene. More and more of them will eventually be settling permanently on the urban periphery and meld into the general population. In its several dimensions, inequality, social, geographic, economic, and cultural, has been one of the byproducts of China's single-minded pursuit of economic growth. Here, I will mention only the most frequently used index of inequality, the Gini Index for Income Distribution that ranges from zero of complete equality to one of complete inequality. In 1982, China had one of the lowest Gini coefficients for household income of any country for which this measure was available. Now, 32 years later, it stands at 0 0.47, which compares to the US index of 0 0.45, Japan at 0 0.38, and the European Union at 0 0.31. High income inequality has thus become a major concern for the Chinese government. Given the present economic situation worldwide, it is unlikely, however, that countermeasures will succeed to significantly improve the country's existing income distribution. I turn now to the question of personal freedoms in the socialist market economy. As evident from the emerging social stratification, reforms have been have done relatively little so far to enlarge the personal freedoms of the indigent and working poor. It is chiefly the social strata above them, the consuming classes of the expanding middle, who enjoy most of the new freedoms, such as extended life expectancy at birth, private home ownership, along with the right to organic homeowner association, organized uh, homeowner associations, quality medical care, more open egalitarian gender relations, hugely expanded consumer choices, universal access to books, newspapers, cell phones, the internet and television, pathways to tertiary education and international travel. But for everyone, without exception, restrictions on important freedoms have remained in place 
throughout this political cycle. The one-child-per-family policy instituted in the early 80s, the differentiation between agricultural and urban residence permits, and the ubiquitous political censorship. Challenging communist hegemony continues to be strictly forbidden and remains taboo. On the other hand, poverty alleviation in rural areas has been extraordinary. According to Barry Norton, the number of rural residents who were poor in 1978, which he estimates at 250 million, had shrunk to 26 million by 2004. Much of this gain was a result of urbanization in situ in place, particularly through small-scale manufacturing by township and village enterprises that by the late 90s had surged to one third of industrial production, though declining thereafter. Chinese villages became electrified, housing quality improved, new roads were built connecting village to city, and frequent contact with urban centers via marketing, migration, and remittances became normalized. In the end, the rapid outward expansion of cities began swallowing up collective village lands. Sooner or later, rural land was transformed into urban land that could now be disposed of by the local state. And for many, farming was little more than a memory of hard times. Especially in the coastal provinces, newly landless farmers could comfortably retire on annuities paid by their collective village, which had become urban. And this is the end of the second cycle. I come now to the political cycle number three, the reach for global power. After nearly three decades of the eroding socialist market economy, a time when primary, if not exclusive, attention was focused on economic growth, the inherent contradictions of this strategy became increasingly apparent. At some point, two-digit growth would have to give way to a more sustainable rate, and the global recession of 2008 turned out to be the turning point. Initially, the government attempted to mitigate a sudden decline in export orders through huge investments in high-speed rail and other infrastructure. But this, too, had its limits. And as the global recession receded, economic growth declined to what some now refer to as the new normal, a 7% annual rate of GDP growth which, if maintained for a decade, would double production. This new normal foreshadows the end of the second political cycle, which I date from the turnover in national leadership from Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping, who was elected general secretary of the CCP in 2012. That's four years ago. By now, China's economy has become so strong and its international entanglements so numerous that a new political cycle seems inevitable. The transition from one cycle to the next will certainly not be as cataclysmic as the change from collectivism to Deng's market economy. With the end of Hu Jintao's leadership period, much unfinished business remains, such as the completion of the urban transition and continuing institutional work to perfect China's market economy. But other domestic issues immediately confront the new paramount leader. Let me give you an idea of his agenda. Eradicate rampant corruption in the CCP uh, it's the CCP is the, the Communist Party. 
at, at all levels, greatly expand domestic markets for Chinese-made goods while retrenching exports. Third, create enough jobs to reduce mounting urban poverty as well as under and unemployment in the face of a radically reduced long-term rate of growth and, importantly, continuing technological progress. Fourth, facilitate the progressive economic and social integration of tens of millions of rural migrants in cities. Fifth, continually, continuously modernize the country's hierarchical administrative system in forms of local governance. Six, to begin to reduce both household income inequality and the excessively unequal spatial distribution of economic development across the country. Seventh, address the multiple challenges caused by the unfettered pursuit of maximum economic growth without regard to environmental damage. And lastly, creatively respond to the growing unrest in ethnic border regions of China, especially in Tibet and Xinjiang. But above all, Xi Jinping's greatest challenge will be to reposition China in the global system, which is why I have tentative why I have tentatively called the third political cycle the reach for global power. Only four years have so far elapsed of what I believe to be this new cycle, and we still lack the perspective to sense its overall direction. What we do know is that Xi made himself paramount leader in a very short time, and that he almost immediately declared war on corruption, especially within the party. He also abandoned the one child per family policy and eliminated distinction between agricultural and urban resident permits, which made holders of the former into second class citizens, thus contributing to the equalization of life chances, at least in this regard. Both of these moves strengthened party legitimacy and somewhat expanded personal freedoms for many. On the other hand, she tightened control over the media and began clamping down on dissident intellectuals and human rights lawyers. It may take another generation to judge the outcomes of this new political cycle, especially in view of the widespread disenchantment in the West with neoliberal policies and globalization. And now I come to my Conclusion, the lessons of history. I've come to the end of my story. We have looked at two political cycles in the history of the People's Republic since the beginning, for two thirds of a century. I have also argued that the PRC is now starting its third, third cycle, which is striving to position China as a global power. What have we learned from this brief journey into the past about poverty, inequality, and personal freedom? I promise to be brief. In the first cycle, Mao Zedong achieved his goal. He has unified China and now embarks on a collectivist experiment. Communes in the countryside and Dunway in the city. People are guaranteed a basic livelihood, and equality is achieved, but the costs are enormous. Hunger during the years of the Great Leap Forward and social chaos during the Cultural Revolution. Personal freedoms are suppressed. In comparison to East Asia and Western Europe, China's economy remains economically and technologically backward. The egalitarian experiment has failed. In the second cycle, initiated by Deng Xiaoping, China opens up to the world and the economy is decollectivized. Dubbed a socialist market economy with Chinese characteristics, a large state sector continues to be protected from the market, but everywhere else, a competitive price system 
ensures greater efficiency in the allocation of resources. This opening releases tremendous creative power and energy. The, the, the opening releases the tremendous creative power and energy of the Chinese people. The state promotes economic growth as a first priority. China becomes a producer for world markets, and by the end of the cycle, is second only to the United States in total production. But the costs incurred are heavy. China now ranks among the group of countries that have the highest indices of income inequality worldwide. As urbanization continues, the new poor begin to arrive in large numbers, including the 150 million rural migrants looking for work each year in the thriving eastern seaboard cities in construction and the dirty work of daily life. Nor in the single-minded pursuit of hyper-rapid growth has the environment been heated and serious damage continues to be done to the collective resources of air, water, and land, endangering people's health and well-being. A sustainable development has yet to be achieved in China. Amidst this prosperity, an incipient class system emerges. It is the middle income sectors who are the principal beneficiaries of public policies, and their enjoyment of personal freedoms expands disproportionately in comparison to the indigent population who remain statistically significant, and the masses of the working poor who have little to cheer about. As for political freedoms or liberty, even the topic remains off limits for discussion. China has reached the point where it now aspires to become a global power, even as it battles to reverse the unintended costs inflicted on the country in the preceding cycle. Excessive inequality, deep corruption among the political class, and the destruction and losses suffered by the environment. These Herculean tasks have been bequeathed to the new generation of leaders headed by Xi Jinping, who initiates the third political cycle of the Communist Party of China, ruled under severe economic constraints. And the lesson of history is perhaps this. Each of the two political cycles I have sketched lasted for about 30 years. Each begins with a powerful vision, the gallant utopia of a classless society, the heady promise of a socialist market economy, and ends with a sense of profound disappointment. The 18th century German philosopher Hegel called such unanticipated and indeed unwelcome outcomes, the rules of reason, or the list der Vernunft, which hides from us the full consequences of our actions. Hegel's understanding reflects a tragic view of history, that even our best intentions tend to fall short of their initial promise, and yet, we continue to try, perhaps as the Irish poet Samuel Beckett writes, next time to fail better. That's my story. <laughs> Comments or questions or observations? Um, Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm not sure how specifically you're familiar with statistics, but Gini coefficients in China has been decreasing in the past two or three years. Do you think it could be an indication of the reversal of the trend or just a temporary threatening? The, the what? Uh, Gini coefficient you were talking about? The Gini? Yeah. I have no idea. Okay. I, can, I only report what I read. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 
And, you know, I don't, it's a very aggregate measure. And it serves the purpose of a, of a talk like this, but, but it doesn't actually get into the detail uh, between urban and rural and particular cities and so on. And, and, and the whole question of, of inequality, I think, needs the kind of refinement that comes from field studies, such as the one that Lee Jung uh, reports from Kunming. And her, her, her book that I was quoting from is, is about the, the middle sectors of the, uh, in, in Kunming, and, but she contrasts them with the poor. So it's only in, in comparisons that you can talk about the poor. When, when everybody's equally poor, they don't feel poor. You don't, they have nothing to compare yourself to. The rest of the world, you live in a bubble of information about the world. You only know what you see. And, uh, and so if everybody else more or less is treated the same way, then everybody is the normal. It's the condition of life. That's, 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 what, that, that's what I wanted to say. Professor Cheek. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And I continue to think you've got China right. But I, my question is about planning. You've talked about the ruse of reason and uh, what's happened with, uh, we might call it the state plan, or the plan of Chinese leaders. But you are the eminent squeeze of a planning school. What are the lessons? of the story. The same lesson. For planning. It's the same lesson. Um, I, 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 um, well, I was talking yesterday to some students in the Habitat course. They were giving a course in the Habitat 3 in, in, that is taking place within another 10 days or so in, in Ecuador, in, 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 um, uh, in Quito, yeah. And, uh, and I was sort of, I was talking about precisely this, that the, the, the 40 years that I have been watching habitats, from the habitat uh, in 76, that took the first habitat in 76 that took place with a grand vision um, of how the world must change. And 76 is the very cusp of the change from the, the welfare, the Keynesian economy to the, to the new neoliberal economy. And lo and behold, the world ignores Habitat I and goes on its merry way to produce the kind of inequalities and poverty that we see around the world. And, 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 and in the meantime, what we, th what we thought of would become a world order in a very positive way has become a world disorder. And we live in a, under conditions of permanent war. So I'm not very op optimistic. I think it's my, my problem is I've lived too long <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, to be able to have this sort of look backwards. Of, of 40 years. And of course, I, I'm positive in terms of dealing with realities that you, that you confront. I'm not, not, I, I'm not saying that one should give up. One has to struggle in order to just stay where you are. But you have to really work hard to not slide backwards. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. This yeah. is very interesting. So, what do you, what are your thoughts on the fact that that there ha the you know the percentage of uh, people in abject poverty is has been you know rapidly decreasing, and and that probably a lot of it has to be, has to do with you know what's happened in China and what's happening in India. <coughs> so there is this, you know, I mean that's. That's good news. That's good news. That's, yeah. Well, that's, that's that's, news. that's that is good news. That's why I began with uh, with with noting the achievements. Mm -hmm. They're not insignificant. They're extremely important. 
you have, you know, your lifespan has extended. You have, you have created a, a educational system for for all children. And while it varies from province to province in China, uh, as it does here, um, the overall progress progress is is, is steady and, and and continues. And 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 so all of the other points that I that are raised, seventy five percent home ownership for urban poor is much higher than than, than in Canada <coughs> or in the United States. Um, so there's a lot there's a lot that has been accomplished. But when you talk about the vision, I was talk I began my my the, the political, each political cycle was informed by a vision. And, you know, the, the egalitarian utopia of Mao led basically to, to, to a failure. Uh, and, and, and now the, 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 new, the new middle class uh, economy that we have, uh, uh, high high growth economy, has created all of these other problems. It created poverty and inequality, uh, destroyed the environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so you you, ma you make progress in one direction, and you have the the other effects on the, uh, the so-called side effects that actually become then the main effects in the in the next period what will happen to to the to the china's global reach i uh, hate to think but we, when when you read that, that the chinese navy now has a naval base in africa in djibouti uh, you, you 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 can see what they are trying to do and they are trying to secure for themselves a safe passage from Africa to to China, in order, because Africa is a, a continent of resources from which they draw. So they're, they're, that's that's their short-term objective, and then you know there are other lo longer-term objectives. Interestingly enough, with this, with this, I just read um, uh, an article that Mao Mao. The Maoists is making a comeback. Uh, the the Maoist um, enthusiasts for for the egalitarian economy and the collectivist economy uh, are getting uh, more increased exposure now on the Xi Jinping. So we'll see what happens. Paul, uh, John, if. Um you, you kind of left us on a gloomy note. And no, it, and it's it, raining. This is a, and this is yeah. a gloomy era, you know, when we we're talking with our students mm -hmm. and we're trying to find out what point we're at in history. You know, a lot of people are talking the 1930s again uh, and the failure of democratic governance, uh, attacks on global markets. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of left with a view that if we can't find some leadership in China, uh, on global issues, where are we going to find it? And I wanted to put a question to you that's been in mind all the time that I've known you. Do you think the world would be a better place if China behaved more like the United States? <laughs> was it, was it? <laughs> no, he's not joking. <laughs> United States with Mr. Trump as president? Well, Chinese choose their leaders better than Americans do. Um, well, I mean, that's it's kind of useless even to speculate about that because China will never become like the United States. China is a civilization. It's not just another country. It's a civilization. And, and, and we have to we have to remember that because it, it, civilizations don't just, an old civilization like China's does not simply disappear. It, it creates its own, has its own genius, its own uh, momentum and its own thought patterns. 
And as, as, as you well know, the, the Chinese classics are becoming more popular again uh, after Mao, and people are uh, reading the old poetry and uh, speculate about so what Confucius would say or speculate what Lao Tse would say and so on. So we have, we have the, 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 a cultural re revival of Confucianism in China is that we don't have a cultural revival in the United States at the moment. Uh, we don't even, we have a revival of kinds in Canada at the moment. We have a, a young premier, a prime minister. Um, but but uh, it's, it's not the philosophic, on the philosophic level, no. So I don't know, but uh, I think Ch China will carve its own future. What did you mean, Paul, about, about China becoming more like the United States? Did you mean in terms of political democracy? I remember Barack Obama made a comment that we all know where political destiny lies. It's just different paths to get there. And there's an American belief in universalisms. John's view and John Fairbank and others is there aren't universal futures. There are being mm. civilization to the future. But you know, we assumed even a generation ago of some kind of convergence in economic system and a <clears throat> political system. And we're now in a moment where most of us don't think that convergence is either possible or maybe even desirable uh, as we see. Yeah. Some of the problems. I think it's neither possible nor desirable. Possible nor desirable. Yes, please. I just wanted to add a little bit in the optimistic side that you just mentioned. I live on the other side of the border, and I just traveled for the last two years, crossing China from south to north to Mongolia and Central Asia to through China to Tibet and back. And I've observed so many uh, very optimistic trends, which you can only see at the bottom. And the trends that I've seen, to add to your third, the third part, the last four years, is I've seen a lot of uh, young Chinese traveling throughout their country on bicycles, foot, with backpacks, and I've had conversations with them. And these are where I think the new will come. No, I'm convinced that that's, that yeah. that's the case. I, and it's not, I it's think, not I think you, it's you, not you, written about, but it's there, and <coughs> it's alive, and it's all over the place, whether it's in Tibet, whether it's yeah. in Mongolia. These young men and women are <coughs> going around, and uh, they're young, 20 to 30 at the moment, yeah. and they're questioning their system, and they're free, and they've had enough of the yeah. buying things. Mm -hmm. And from them, you will have something new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we don't know what. No, yeah. that's the good part. Yeah. And it can't be devised yeah. by yeah. Uh, scholars and everyone else. Yeah. yeah. So that's all I have to um, Well, one of my, one of my, my greatest worries, uh, actually, it has to do with uh, technological unemployment. Uh, I've been reading about robotization and uh, the rap progress of robotization that that will render obsolete many of the jobs that are currently held by human beings and in China it will be among the first to ro robotize its production um, the, the Japanese have, have, have also uh, done that uh, particularly in automobile production and and heavy industry, um, but with uh, artificial intelligence and uh, uh, making huge progress, as we see with the automatic cars, uh, self-driving cars, uh, that are already on the roads in Pittsburgh and elsewhere. Um, I think we're going to see huge increase in 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 um, in unemployment or underemployment. Now, 
That may be good. I, I can give you, I can put a, a, a good spin on that. But that would take us uh, half the evening here to, 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 to discuss. But, but I think it's something, something to worry. Yeah, but the good spin on that one is that the many of the urban young couples are moving out and going into the country. Well, that's that's. And that's not a small amount. In in China yes. too, yeah, they're moving, they're moving out, out into out the country this bit. and starting the they're utopian out. communes. They're going no, they're no. going on their own. Whatever. Oh, just doing agriculture, Farm, farming. Agriculture. Well, I don't know. I haven't seen that. You, you've seen it with your own eyes, so, right, so I'm not disputing you know. anything. <laughs> you have seen. Mark, you've been out at some point. You had your yeah, but I, I think uh, go ahead. Do, do, do you want to? Uh, you, you said it would take uh, the, the whole evening to do a positive spin. Can you do a one-minute positive spin just so we can end up with a? So we can enjoy the cake. Yeah. Well, well, I read. I don't know whether it, it's 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 true, but I read that recently Sweden has changed its standard week, work week, from eight hours to six hours. So releasing time for the production of use values. Now what you do with these use values is, is an individual choice, not a collectivist choice. If you wanted to make films, just, right? So that's what you'll be doing, so long as you have some kind of an income that supports your work. So it will require a welfare, st the return of the welfare state is what one of the things I predict. It's it necessary in, in the, the kind of unemployment that you have now in the Mediterranean, for example. 30% in uh, of the, uh, the relevant age categories in, 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 in Spain and in Greece and in Italy. It's only possible if they're not starving. So they, they obviously they're getting welfare payments of one sort or another. And then with that, if you're not in the, in, in, in the game of amassing wealth, if you're in the game of satisfying your own desires for, for becoming meaningfully active, that's what you do. And so that's a positive way of looking, or you go to, to the countryside, that's what you were saying. So we hopefully we spend those extra two hours in community and in social networks and not just on Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>